Welcome all to a conversation with Robert Bartholomew. First, for those not in the know, please tell the viewers who you are. I'm an honorary senior lecturer in the Department of Psychological Medicine at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. And I've been studying outbreaks of mass psychogenic illness now for the last uh, 35 years, that and social panics. I want to let the viewers know that I first learned of you when Havana syndrome uh, became news back in 2017, I think it was. So in the beginning it was actually referred to as sonic attacks in Cuba, at least on Wikipedia, and being an engineer and having worked on weapons systems, uh, the claims being made, the damage that was being done supposedly by energy weapons sounded to me ridiculous. So my skeptical alarms um, all went off. I read as much as I, I, I could find. And um, when I got a job writing for Skeptical Inquirer, I reached out to you on this subject, right? So can you describe what the US government had said was going on and what was their evidence? In late 2016, there was a intelligence officer in Cuba who, who heard strange sounds outside his home. And then in December, he had head pain, an earache, and some difficulty hearing. He went to the embassy clinic and he said, you know, it's as if someone's pointing a beam of sound at my home at night. And when a couple of other officers said the same thing, this folk theory emerged that the Cubans, working perhaps with the Russians or the Chinese, were harassing American diplomats and intelligence officers with some type of sonic weapon using sound. And they came to that speculation because there's a long history in Cuba of American diplomats being harassed. For example, people wake up in the morning and you'd walk downstairs and there'd be cigarette butts on your kitchen table and you don't smoke. There'd be dog poo on your kitchen floor and oh, you don't have that. Much worse than um, the cigarettes. Yeah, much worse. And uh, so anyway, that's why they thought that. And that's the thing with mass psychogenic illness. They are all couched in a key social, cultural, political, historical context. And that was the context. They just don't suddenly happen. And that's the job of the researcher is to look at the information and figure out the context and what generated the anxiety, because all of these cases are triggered by anxiety as well. And um, so anyway, in a nutshell, they started searching for unicorns when they should have stuck to horses, more mundane explanations. There was some bad science, there was some bad journalism, and there was some botched government. And that added up to Havana syndrome, which went on for six and a half years, about six years too long. In December of 2017, I published the first journal article, medical article on Havana syndrome in the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine. And I said, the claims were unsound. That's a direct quote. And basically that article has stood the test of time. Now on March 1st of this year, five different American intelligence agencies have concluded that there was no evidence of any foreign actor and that what happened was you got an array of existing medical conditions, environmental circumstances and conditions, and anxiety adding up to Havana syndrome. And, you know, when people say, oh, it's mass psychogenic illness, not necessarily. I'd say the majority of cases weren't mass psychogenic illness. There were simply people waking up and hearing strange sounds and having been told if you hear a strange sound, it might be a sonic attack and later a microwave attack. And um, so they hear the sound, they expect to feel symptoms and they do, or they feel symptoms of something. And then they, they look around for a sound and of the first 21 victims, eight recorded their attacks. And later in a classified uh, study that was not released under the Freedom of Information Act until September of 2021, um, this group of scientists had analyzed eight of those recordings and they concluded they were the mating call of the Indies short-tailed cricket. But that yeah. wasn't released. And the FBI report, which concluded it was mass psychogenic illness back in 2018, that still hasn't been released. So I like to say in a nutshell, this is a case of politics mixing with science and that's why it took so long. You add lawyers to the mix and you got your six and a half years. Yeah. So 
Uh, I read your book and, uh, and I found it so fascinating. Uh, I did a official book review for Skeptical Inquirer, although it was years after it was printed because uh, Havana Syndrome was back in the news. I had watched a report on 60 Minutes on CBS where they were saying that even people behind the gates at the White House were not safe. That's right. And that, you know, that was so upsetting because I grew up really worshiping 60 Minutes. And then they put trash TV on like that. And, and I never talk like that, but it's upsetting because they were interviewing this guy who claimed he and his family in China had been attacked and stuff like this. And they came back to the U.S. and they're staying in a hotel in Philadelphia. And they were being uh, um, checked out by uh, some uh, doctors nearby. And he claimed in the middle of the night that um, he saw one of his children thrashing around in bed. And then the other one was thrashing. And he picked one of them up and he heard this whooshing sound like water running. Then when he picked the other one up, he heard the same thing. And the implication was in that show that it might have been some type of microwave attack by a foreign power, perhaps mm -hmm. the Russians. And I have no problem with them speculating about that. But the problem was that is such a common symptom and they should have known this. It's a common symptom of tinnitus. In fact, there's a... Uh, article online that says, is that the water running or is that tinnitus? That was the title. So how Because does, it's such a common symptom. How does a big news agency like that know? Or do you think they know that and didn't care? I think they knew and they just wanted, they just presented one side. You know, that's a tip off and um, clicks and views. And it's really... Uh, unfortunate. And and look, that's what happened with the National Academy of Sciences study. They were interviewing outliers. Uh, David Relman at uh, Stanford University, great scientist for microbiology, but not for the vestibular system in the inner ear. And um, they were saying, oh, it's pulse microwave radiation. There was only one other study that suggested that. That was the small study that the FBI had commissioned. And the thing in common there was it was David Relman, who was the head of that study as well. Nobody else, none of the other panels or studies concluded it was pulse microwave radiation. So, um, and and so they were interviewing all these outlier scientists. They didn't interview the mainstream scientists, the mainstream skeptics. None of us were interviewed. With the report on the first of this month, do you think this is the end of it? I read that Marco Rubio, who my recollection is way back when this started, was complicit in actually pointing the blame with no evidence that it was definitely something that we were attacked in Cuba. He, he released a statement saying, basically, I don't believe anything in that report. Yeah. I think this is the, finally the, the beginning of the end. It will now slowly fade away. Because in the past, people were skeptical of us. And now with the agencies aligning what we said all along, in that classified government report from 20, uh, 2018, uh, did an update in November of 2021, and they cited myself and Professor Balo at UCLA all over the place. And I, I think the CIA report, when the full report's released, will cite us as well. Um, and mm -hmm. I do think it's the beginning of the end here. Um, but you do have lawyers involved. They won't go quietly. But um, I think it's it's just going to slowly now die off because the, the it's just not sound science. It never was sound science. And now people are realizing that, taking the time to actually read the bad studies that were done and published in one of the best journals in the world, the Journal of the American Medical Association. They published two really bad studies that should never have seen the light of day. And that's not an opinion. It's a fact. Anybody that looks at that is a competent uh, neurologist or medical practitioner. It was just bad science. Okay, so. Havana syndrome, hopefully water under the bridge. Let's talk about a new subject. So actually I'm talking to you today because you contacted me and said, hey, how do you like that uh, a Wikipedia article uh, about the poisonings in Iran of schoolgirls?" And I had no knowledge of this. I hadn't seen the article. I didn't even see that story on the news. Somehow I missed it. If American News is covering it, it's not that many months old and it's a, you know, right. like a, a continuing story. Um, yep. So, you know, you want, you want to tell people what that's about in general. Well, that's flown under the radar. It started in November of last year, and it really blew up recently with a, a major case that got a lot of publicity. And the story is that uh, the Iranian government has been poisoning 
schoolgirls with some type of toxic gas. And uh, so about uh, eight or nine days ago, when they had Wait, a can major I stop you case, there? Why, why just schoolgirls? Are the, are the, are the, the, the two genders uh, educated separately in Iran? So it's a different environment or something? Like, why would it just be girls? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of uh, schools with just, with just girls. And uh, so they're supposedly targeting those girls um, as retribution for um, these headscarf protests that have been going on and other, other protests as well. Um, and so you hear that and you think, wow, that's, that's terrible. I heard that. And it's like, wow, school girls are being poisoned. That's, that's a bad thing. But then when you start to look at the case closer, um, over the first three months, no suspect had been captured or even identified. No gas had been identified. No one had died. Everybody recovered quickly. Um, it's a group of young girls during an extraordinary period of stress and turmoil in the government. And what, what do these young girls have in common? They're not able to get redress, right, in terms of, um, you know, if they're not happy with something, you just can't complain to authorities, right? And this outbreak was very similar to what happened in Afghanistan between 2009 and 2018. In fact, the headlines are virtually identical. So I saw because, that comparison made on the Wikipedia article, and I'm not familiar with the story. What, what's that yep. story quickly? And so during 2009 to 2018, you had at least 60 schools where you had mass poisonings of young Afghan schoolgirls, and they rushed to hospital. Uh, nobody ever died, uh, never found uh, the the toxin or anything like that. And then there were several studies. I was involved in one study in Herat province in uh, 2015. Um, we concluded it was mass psychogenic illness. Then the World Health Organization concluded 22 cases were mass psychogenic illness. The United Nations did a separate study. They concluded it was mass psychogenic illness. And between 2002 and 2014, there was this international military monitoring force there. They concluded their own study that it was mass psychogenic illness. And so you've got these headlines. You could take the same headline from Afghanistan, interchange it with what's going on right now in Iran, and it's the exact same thing. Now, in the past 48 hours, the supreme leader in Iran has said he believes it's some type of poisoning, and they will capture these people, and they will bring them to justice. Coincidentally, after three and a half months, all of a sudden, they've found people and they've arrested them and charged them with the poisonings. And to me, that's highly suspicious. Um, same thing happened in Afghanistan. They rounded people up. And I think the government's showing that they're trying to do something and they're trying to show that it's real. And so what you've got going here is you've got two groups and you got the opposition in Iran who hate the government. You've got the government who loathe the opposition. And neither one want the mass psychogenic illness explanation to be true because each one wants to demonize the other. The opposition want the government to look like, you know, they're so bad. You know how bad they are? They they're will poison, poison school girls. young school girls and put their lives in danger, and they just don't care. That's how low they are. And the government's trying to do the same thing with the opposition. And so what, what's what, what really, justification yep. are they saying the opposition is? What would the rationale of the opposition be for poisoning schoolgirls? To, to make the government look bad. Uh, to make them look bad. Oh, the government, they're bad. Swag. They're poisoning these, these schoolgirls. And look, anybody who's poisoning young schoolgirls needs to get a better PR person, right? Because it's just ridiculous. Like it's not going to go well um, publicly, right? And um, so you've got this back and forth going on and I got caught up on it because I had made uh, some statements that I believe this has all the hallmarks of mass psychogenic illness, which I stand by. And then I had all these trolls um, coming at me 
with um, death threats and um, saying that, um, oh, this isn't true. You're a puppet for the Iranian government. And I'm like, no, I'm just making this assessment. And, um, oh, you need to, to stop talking about this. And I'm like, no. And I've done a number of interviews now. I just did one with The Telegraph. Um, and look, the within the past 24 hours, the Iranian health ministry has come out and they have announced that they have had uh, doctors and health specialists go around to schools around the country and they've investigated these cases and they have concluded that about 90% are caused by anxiety, which is a code word for mass psychogenic illness. Now, the other 10%, they said it's not caused by a toxic gas, but a mild irritant, and that's the word they used. I think what you're gonna find out at the end of the day, when all the dust settles and the fog clears, is that it's going to be 100% that's caused by mass psychogenic illness and a redefining of ever-present symptoms as mm. you know being some type of uh, poisoning outbreak. Frankly, a lot of the symptoms, at least as I saw them described in some of the citations from the Wikipedia article, uh, sound similar to Havana syndrome symptoms. Uh, it was fatigue, that's, that's right. that's, headaches, that's, that's nausea. Yeah. That's and, right. You know, you can go right down the list difficulty concentrating you know a common one that people have that's they they describe it as brain fog they're like in a fog mm -hmm. that is a classic description of anxiety so i'm actually looking at the wikipedia article and there is currently it's changing a lot quickly because of what's going on but it says that the deputy health minister i don't know if i could pronounce his name yunus pani something like that He's got the 90% uh, quote, and uh, yeah, that is amazing. But yet, so this just happened, that quote, and yet they've arrested people, blaming them for poisoning people. How are they driving that? How does that work? Well, it doesn't. Um, but um, well, it was interesting because I went on Iranian television a couple of nights ago, and uh, that was an interesting experience. I gave the mass psychogenic illness explanation, and... I, in hindsight, I think they were preparing the public for the 90-10 breakdown. Like, uh -huh. here's this guy arguing it's mass psychogenic illness. And so, look, you've got, like, when you know the facts in this case, when you first hear it, it's like, oh, that's terrible. They're poisoning schoolgirls. When you look at the facts in the case, over 120 schools involved. I mean, that's just, that's like somebody seeing Bigfoot. And it's like, well, maybe Bigfoot's over here. But then you're seeing Bigfoot in 120 different places. It's like, well, how is that possible, right? And well, most of them are misperceptions then, but maybe there was a real sighting. And that's the equivalent of what's going on here, right? And um, so I think by the government arresting people, it, it number one, shows people supposedly publicly, yes, it's the other side. These evil people are foreigners, right? And we've got them. Um, and then the the 10% thing, right, allows for the other 90% to be psychological. And um, so I guess you could say, you know, they were preparing the public by showing my uh, interview on on TV over there. I don't know, but I, I suspect that might have been, been the case because the, I think the writing was on the wall at the time. I think they realized um, that, you know, it is psychogenic because they would have read some of the reports coming out from their own people. And look, it's a pretty pretty standard outbreak i think um when you when you clear away all of the uh politics going on and that's what it is it's the politics um you can't stop an idea now on the internet i mean people say oh you shouldn't give interviews and they're threatening me okay well i just did an interview with the telegraph you're going to stop that um you just can't so the idea is out there and what i said was and i was very polite with these people i said look argue the idea you make the case that it's not mass psychogenic illness. You show me the evidence that there is a poison gas that's involved here, and I will change my mind. But as a scientist, we go by evidence. And that's, people often ask me, do you believe? Do you believe in Bigfoot? Do you believe in Havana syndrome? Do you believe in the Iranian schoolgirls being poisoned? It's not a matter of belief. 
right? It's a matter of evidence and weighing that evidence. Could somebody be going around poisoning young schoolgirls in Iran? Sure they could. But 120 schools over three months, and they didn't even have a suspect. And then all of a sudden, they have all these suspects, right? Um, it just doesn't make sense for, and they would have known, like if they're doing this, it would, people would just go ballistic, uh, hearing that this was going on and be incensed. And so everybody's trying to use it for their own political gain. And that was the problem with Havana syndrome, right? Havana syndrome was politics mixing with science. And it's the same here. And that's why you get some fogginess right now. So, yeah, what, what's your, if you had to be a betting man, how would you bet this is going to, how long is this going to go on for before it's, it, it drifts away and they just forget about it and say, okay, I guess. It depends. It Look, like Havana syndrome, it depends on how the media covers this, you know, and um, you can hype stories up and things like this. But um, I think that, um, you know, it could go on a little while longer, but. You know, it's so clear, the historical antecedents in this case. I mean, this is virtually identical to what happened in Afghanistan from 2009 to 2018. Um, and, and there, as I mentioned, they ended up having 60 schools affected, 60 separate cases. Um, now, you've got 1983, the disputed West Bank region, in the Middle East, you had over a thousand schoolgirls, uh, Palestinian mostly, um, who were affected by poison gas. The theory was that Mossad agents were deliberately poisoning them. As it turned out, there were three different investigations, two published in The Lancet, one published in the American Journal of Psychiatry. All three concluded it was mass psychogenic illness, and they traced it back to an odor from a toilet at a girls' school, and it spread from there and in the media. And there was one media report in particular that was cited in the American Journal of Psychiatry that was particularly egregious to spreading that outbreak. And that was this media report in an Israeli newspaper that said, um, now some of the symptoms included blurry vision. Well, instead of blurry vision, he reported that a number of victims had gone blind. Oh. which caused panic and really exacerbated the situation. And that's part of the reason for the flare up there. Look, the United Nations got involved. There was talk of war at the time in 1983. This was a massive thing in 1983 for a couple of months. And I would think that what's going on now isn't going to last more than I think a few more weeks at the most, um, but you do have the fog of, maybe not of war, but of um, conflict over there. You know, the, the Iranian um, government doesn't have a great track record in terms of, um, you know, what they say. On the other hand, the opposition, um, I mean, some of the things they say are pretty extreme as well. And the truth is probably somewhere in between. But in cases like this, look, it it's not in anybody's interest to poison young schoolgirls. And um, so, look, for the, the thing that stuck out in my mind was when I first heard this, and it blew up in the news about eight, 10 days ago, was the three and a half months that it had been going on um, at that point for at least three months. And they didn't have a suspect. They didn't have a toxic agent. A rapid spread and recovery, a group of young Islamic schoolgirls um, who the rumor was were being targeted because of their opposition with the uh, hijab headscarf um, rules and stuff like that. That just was a giant red flag and a flashback to Afghanistan and what went on there. And then a flashback to what went on in the Middle East and the uh, 1983 I think it was March, April of 83, and then that died down. And it's a flashback to what happened in 1993, north of Cairo, when you had about 1,500 uh, young schoolgirls um, who had these symptoms that were supposedly poisoned as well. Turned out um, that there's no evidence of that. And um, so they, I guess they're seen as a, a vulnerable group in society. And 
you know, whenever something like that happens, it's it it probably flourishes because it's an easy way to demonize the other side that they are so low and they are so deprived that they would go to such lengths as to do something like that. Now, there's another interesting aspect to this case in Iran, and that is typically with an outbreak of mass psychogenic illness, when you get multiple outbreaks like this and you get a wave, there is an initial sensational case. Well, you had cases here, then you had this big blow up case. And then what happened was you had all these cases right afterwards spread around the country. That's classic. And what you got there is like UFOs, like Bigfoot, they report this mass media, social media, be on the lookout for mm. a toxic gas. Mm. And the rumor is that young schoolgirls are being targeted as retribution for not wearing their headscarves and protesting. Now, schoolgirls across Iran are hypervigilant about their environment, their surroundings. And they where they ordinarily, you know, you get cooking stalls and food stalls and all kinds of smells, ordinarily wouldn't pay too much attention. But now that smell you smell might be right. poison gas. Hypersensitive to just like the people in Cuba who were warned to listen for any strange sounds. And then they heard, you know, insect noises and they had never paid attention to it before. Now, all of a sudden it was, oh, we were warned about that noise. And then they get a headache and they connect it. That's right. Exactly what's going on. And so a in a situation like that, where people are hypervigilant, and the rumor is out there that something's going on. If it's Bigfoot, a rustling in the bushes becomes Bigfoot. A light in the night becomes an extraterrestrial spaceship. A wake or log on a lake becomes the Loch Ness Monster. And here, ever-present smells in the environment, whether it's from flowers, whether it's from uh, some industry, uh, whether it's somebody cooking, they become more sensitive to those smells in their environment, and they start to misperceive them as an immediate threat. Some girl, they're in their, uh, under a very stressful situation anyway, they start to hyperventilate, Everyone sees that, becomes really um, very um, excited. And the next thing you know, you got 30 girls being rushed to hospital, believing a headache, nausea, dizziness, um, even convulsions. Then they think they've been attacked by a poison. They check them out at the hospital. There's no evidence of it. Now there's a mystery poison, right? And that's what you get with a lot of cases of mass psychogenic illness, especially the one-off cases. It... If you go online and type in mystery illness, that's usually what the first case was described as, a mystery illness. So uh, the last thing, I don't remember if we talked about this when I interviewed you for uh, the Philadelphia Skeptic Group, but it fascinates me, so I'll bring it up again here, even if we did talk about it, is the people who consider themselves targeted individuals. And for people who don't know what that is, uh, they think that they're being observed and their house is being bugged. Sometimes they think they have implants in them. And my perception is in the old days before social media, they would have just had this delusion and it was carried around on their own. But now you find other people who believe this on the internet and they're in you know private groups who all reinforce these beliefs. Yeah, I can tell you right now that I've gotten a lot of emails from these people uh, my colleague, Robert Barlow, has. I know David Relman made a comment that he received a number of comments from these people as well who believe, oh, Havana Syndrome, that's nothing new. I've been hearing these voices for decades now, and it's they call it cyber stalking, and they set up some kind of equipment nearby in the room next to them. And look, I honestly, I think that most of those people need to see a psychiatrist because they have a psychiatric condition. It's not helping to read in the media that Havana syndrome is real. It gives them one more point in for their belief in this thing that that is not likely to be real. Yeah, it was really, you know, Havana syndrome was bad science, bad government and um, bad journalism.
and it's really unfortunate. Um, I mean, things like that can go on, but it shouldn't have gone on for as long as it did. I think the big factor that was different there was social media, and we live in a partisan age. And um, I've always said, you know, many people have stopped searching for information, and instead they're out searching for confirmation of their pre-existing beliefs. And psychology is, even has a name for that. It's called confirmation bias, the tendency to seek out information that reinforces our pre-existing biases, stereotypes, and beliefs. And then you just disregard anything that's opposed to that. That's right. And I think you're seeing that with Iran right now. And, you know, both sides, neither want to believe it. And that's a problem when neither want to believe it. And they look for little things about how it can't be true and stuff like this. Somebody said there was a case at a bus stop. Okay, there was a case at a bus stop. Um, suddenly that doesn't make this not true. Um, or there, one of them wasn't a schoolgirl. Okay, one of them wasn't a schoolgirl. But I can tell you over the past, well, three and a half decades, I've got over 3,500 cases I've collected of mass psychogenic illness, 99% are majority female. Why that is, is open to debate. I would tend to think it's probably not as much biological or innate genetics, but uh, the roles of people in society. And what's really interesting with Iran is Malaysia, because I did research in Malaysia for many years. There have been hundreds, and I'm not exaggerating, hundreds of reports in Malaysia since the mid-1960s of mass psychogenic illness in schools involving almost all Malay, Muslim, young female schoolgirls. And very, very similar. There's no means of redress. Um, and instead of a smell, it's, it's usually they're under very um, pressure cooker situations. And it, it ends up being um, dissociation states. And it's perceived as uh, demonic possession. Oh. Very common, very common. So what, what do you think the next scare is going to be? I think there's always going to be a next scare, a next social panic. My gut feeling is it's going to be food. And you've started to see this now. Uh, over the past year and a half, you had people eating Lucky Charms cereal and posting to the I Am Poisoned website that it was making them sick. And so it's been going for a few years now. But when this happened, we're not just talking a few people. 7,300 people posted to the website claiming that they'd eaten Lucky Charms cereal and it made them sick. So many that the FDA got involved and investigated. General Mills, who makes the cereal, said, look, we can't find anything wrong with the cereal. The FDA investigated and a while back they concluded there was nothing wrong with the cereal. And then shortly thereafter, people started posting to the I Am Poison website that they ate Cheerios and it was making them sick. And General Mills said, gee, we can't find anything wrong with the Cheerios. And so this is a trend I'm seeing. And things like this can potentially cost companies tens of millions of dollars right? I mean, look what happened with the Gardasil vaccine for the human papillomavirus. You had a group of schoolgirls in Australia who were being vaccinated. Uh, this was around 2006, 2007. A girl fainted. The uh, rest of the girls felt uh, faint and unwell. And even though it turned out to be anxiety, it wiped Australian $1 billion from the share value of Gardasil in just a few days. So this is a real concern. It's, it's quite amazing. Okay, fascinating subject. I think we can end it there. Uh, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you, Rob.